So you just bought this big pile of 1,700 games. Maybe you thought it was a steal getting Night in the Woods plus another 1,699 games for just five bucks, or maybe you're a casual gamer that doesn't even know what an itch.io is, but heard about a good cause you could support. But either way, you are now the proud owner of more games than you will ever play. So what now? Well, hopefully I can help you pierce through the fog of decision paralysis, but even as a reviewer specifically making a video to help you plumb the depths of this bundle, I don't have enough time to play anything close to every single one of them, so this list is by no means exhaustive. And even if you completely miss the bundle, that doesn't mean that you can't pick up a vast majority of these games anyway if any of them sound interesting. So, you can alternatively consider this a big pile of like 30 indie recommendations. But before we get to that, there are a lot of no-brainers on this list that are well known enough that you can get easy recommendations for them already. Pyre? Play that. Night in the Woods? Play that. Oxenfree? Play that. Celeste? Play that. Nuclear Throne? One Shot? Octodad? Cook Serve Delicious? Quadrilateral Cowboy? Minute? Dujana? Play all of that. Happen to have a tabletop group and think the Lancer RPG looks neat? Fucking play that. All of those games are awesome, and you might not even need me to tell you they're awesome. On top of that, there are also a lot of games in this bundle that I've already told you are awesome. You can already watch my opinions on Signs of the Sojourner, A Short Hike, Kids, Jump Grid, Ethereal, Runner 3, Dio, Semblance, Can Androids Pray, The Hex, and Future Grind in videos I've already made. So while I would recommend any one of those games, and I'll include links in the description, they'll be stepping aside so I can make new recommendations today. Starting with a game that I've already wanted to talk about a bit more in depth. Let me tell you about Sound Dodger Plus. If you're a regular viewer, you might remember this one coming up in a recent video, and I absolutely had to take the time to talk about it directly because my god do I love this game to death. Made all the way back in 2013, Sound Dodger can best be described as a bullet hell rhythm game where the projectiles all combine to create different abstract patterns you have to dodge. And yeah, when you describe it on paper, it probably sounds a little basic, but just sit down and check this out for five seconds, because some games are easier to understand visually. Sound Dodger is a playable painting. It is an actual, physical dance. At first you'll feel completely clueless and just get buffeted around the dance floor, but there are patterns to be found here. And once you figure out each song's individual steps, Sound Dodger feels like the ballroom dance to DDR's modern pop song Stepping. It is flowing, elegant, and a thing of pure beauty. Every song a mathematically calculated waltz to move and step with. Sometimes this game focuses more on the aesthetic beauty of its abstract designs, and you don't even have to move to avoid projectiles, but it's also so gorgeous that it's hard to fault the game, especially when combined with the music. It also somehow got some pretty big composers, from Austin Winery to Danny Baranowski to write tracks specifically for the game. Somehow this masterpiece came and went and barely made a blip on anyone's radar, but if you have any love for rhythm games whatsoever, you owe it to yourself to play this one. However, it's not the only one you'll have to try out if you like music games. Obviously, Super Hexagon is also in this list, and if you've never played it, it's a more frenetic, pulse-pounding cousin to Sound Dodger, honestly. And if you do have fond memories of Super Hexagon, you'll absolutely love Hyper Gauntlet, an endless runner that has you dodging blocks and beat with the music. It's a pure reflex game that you can figure out in five minutes. Literally everything to know about it is on screen right now, but still want to spend hours mastering. And then there's Micron, a puzzle game where you have to navigate these balls to an exit with a system of bumpers. The twist is that the balls are fired out in rhythm to the beat, and every time you hit a bumper, it creates a note. So you start with an empty puzzle board like this... And then in the process of solving the puzzle, you create your very own lo-fi hip-hop beat to chillax a study to. And there's a lot of different ways this game is appealing. The puzzles are engaging just on a basic level, but it's also ingenious how some of these different songs come together, especially when you realize that the same bass instruments and mechanics are being used to make a dozen different beats. 
But if there's one category that's well and truly represented in this bundle, it's visual novels. Not a huge surprise given that itch.io is the land of the one-man indie band and visual novels tend to be one of the most budget-friendly types of game to make, but if you need some help wading through your wealth of options, I have two new strong recommendations I can make. The first is for One Night Stand, which picks up with a pretty simple premise. You had a wild night out, drank way too much, and woke up the next morning next to someone you've never met and no clue how you got there. It's a straightforward premise, but the following 20 to 30 minutes are a heartfelt and frank conversation between two people trying to navigate an awkward situation that could go wrong any dozen ways. But the title that really stands out exists on the fringes of what's considered gaming at all, instead preferring to label itself a piece of interactive fiction. Let's talk about If Not Us. If Not Us follows a band of five heroes, sort of like if you made Watchmen a D&D party of fantasy world saviors instead of superheroes. Most of them are pretty awful people, they all have hang-ups, and as the game sets up right from the start, all five of them are doomed to die on their quest. It's about as gritty as it sounds, but it's also incredibly roundabout in telling the details of what actually happens to its party of heroes. Each hero gets their own chance to tell their story, and not a single one of them are linear about telling it, nor entirely reliable as a narrator. They can't even seem to agree on what order they die in. Each one has their own quirks to how you reveal information. One is done via text adventure, another is writing a long and wandering note with multiple choice prompts on what they want to write next, and one is even just talking to the bad guys. Trying to put the exact details together may well be a fool's errand, as even after reading each story I'm still not entirely sure as to the order of events, much less what they are, but what truly shines through about If Not Us is the story's overall tone, as well as how each character's perceptions of each other completely differ. For example, one character is often comforted by another party member's seemingly unshakable faith, only for you to realize in that companion's story that they're straight up an atheist, and whatever piety their friend sees in them is almost entirely imagined. Discovering those points of discord between the party members are the high points of If Not Us, and make it one of the best text-based games i found in the bundle. However, we're not done yet, because there's another pile of games in this bundle that have significant overlap with visual novels. Queer games. Blind Men, Dungeons and Lesbians, Highway Blossoms, A New Life, heck, there's even an entire trilogy culminating in the simply named Three Lesbians and a Barrow. All of which I couldn't find time to play, but all look interesting and fit both categories. Those looking for LGBTQ games have no shortage of options, but one of the more widely recognized titles on this list is Extreme Meat Punks Forever, which honestly describes itself best with a perfect pitch. A serial visual novel slash mech brawler about four gay disasters beating up neo-Nazis and giant robots made of meat. Oh my god. You're serious. They're made out of... meat. Meat Punks kind of requires you to meet it on its terms. Its art is rough to the point of feeling placeholdery, its combat is a two-button tug-of-war with little depth that I was more than happy to skip, and the story, while good, mostly feels like a prologue to a much larger journey. But my God, is the moment-to-moment -moment writing in this one good. Particular standouts are any scenes where characters jack into their mechs, whatever worries they carry with them fading away as they're subsumed by this foreign entity they're plugging into as they become something more. And that alone is enough to make meat punks worth looking at. But if visual novels don't do it for you, maybe you'd like to take a spin with the equally evocative Boa Retina, a quick 20-minute mood piece that pits you against this bastard eyeball angel thing that insists you prove your self-worth to it in the most condescending manner possible, while also dismissing your every attempt to do exactly that as a lie. The writing here is downright skin-crawling and infuriating as it explores the trans experience, namely what it's like to live in a family that outright rejects one's transition, and it makes for an intense, highly emotional trip. But as good as Boa Retina is, the real game I want to talk about arguably tackles all these same themes in a more fully realized package. Let's chat for a minute about Secret Little Haven. Much like Boa Retina, Secret Little Haven is about a trans woman working through her struggles with self-identity, in this case picking up right at the moment that she begins to embrace it. It's also delivered entirely through a 90s AIM messenger style chat system that has a whole bunch of nostalgia wrapped in it, but it's also not that far removed from the way I still see people act on Discord today. Most of the game is also based around a fan community for a magical girl show, and honestly, watching characters talk about their favorite magical girls and queer fanships just sounds like a visit to Tumblr or a She-Ra fan page. So honestly, even if you don't suffer from a hearty dose of 90s nostalgia, I'm sure you'll at least recognize a little bit of your teenage years in there somewhere. Turns out the more things change, the more they stay the same. And the game's not perfect. 
in particular, the ending feels like it kind of just resolves itself way too cleanly and easily, but this is generally a game that wants to lean towards optimism, so I get wanting to have a cleaner ending, and all the steps getting there are well executed and engrossing to follow. It uses a lot of the same tricks Boa Retina does, in forcing you to confront an authoritative and dismissive family member in a more digestible, less art housey package, and overall, I think it's a less intense experience. But while Boa Retina might feel like a raw scream of anguish trying to capture a very specific mental space, Secret Little Haven feels significantly more fully realized as an overall experience. And naturally, as a narrative about a trans woman discovering her identity, it also has a lot of thematic discussion about manhood, toxic masculinity, and what exactly each character thinks a man is supposed to look and act like. Secret Little Haven's darkest moments are the only thing Boa Retina captures, while the former explores a fuller spectrum of emotions and relationships, and I definitely think it's worth a look. But if there's one other genre in this bundle that's almost as crowded as visual novels, it's shmups. So let's stop and talk about a few for a minute. Namely, I want to highlight Dimension Drive. Dimension Drive's big twist is that it gives you two boards to play on that you can teleport between at will. It leads to a number of interesting navigational challenges as you're forced to fling yourself between boards to open gates, get around impassable walls, and navigate fields of lasers. Pardon the pun, but it adds an additional dimension to everything you have to consider when you're normally playing a shmup. Navigating an asteroid field? Better check where you're going on the other side, because if you teleport into an asteroid... Well, that's it for you. Want to get that power up? It's probably going to require some form of jumping between both boards to get around walls. Looking to get a high score? Well, now you have two unique simultaneous boards of enemies you have to frantically bounce between if you want to get it. More than just having an interesting hook, Dimension Drive is noteworthy for just how well it attaches that hook to literally every part of the standard shmup experience. While eventually it does start throwing waves of enemies at you, it both gives you space early on to wrap your head around its personal mechanics, and spends the entire game slowly doling out new ones that each genuinely complicate gameplay in a positive way without getting dumped on you so quickly that you start getting lost. The only place where it really falters is with its bosses, which are unfortunately lacking in impact and interesting mechanics, but everything else about the game was solid and entertaining from front to back. But if Dimension Drive isn't your jam, you could always try Rim 9000, a game that operates on the idea that you can never have enough chunky, pixely effects as it pushes its visuals to limits of comprehensibility. Also, I have to stop for a side note, huge big seizure warning here like you wouldn't even believe. If you're even mildly worried about it, skip to the next section. Okay? Okay. Rim 9000 is pure juice taken to a nonsensical degree. You'll probably already know whether you'll love it or not in the first 30 seconds when it cheesily blasts WORLD GOVERNMENT in an exploding font as if that's supposed to actually mean something, while the screen shakes so much that you'd think the camera was attached to an actual plane. It's absolutely overhyped nonsense, yes, but it is glorious nonsense to revel in. But it's also unfortunately nonsense that crashes every 30 minutes, doesn't play remotely well with my computer, and requires a heavy amount of repetition and memory to get through its levels. This bundle also has Zone of Lacrima, a much moodier piece following a fighter pilot in Norwellian dystopia. Zone of Lacrima pitches itself as a more narrative-centric shmup, but its plot is still relatively simple and bare bones. What really caught my attention about this game was how it handled difficulty, with three different speeds you can fly at and a risk-reward system based around how fast you move. Zone of Lacrima is already on the easier side as far as shmups go, but if you're feeling the difficulty, you can hit the brakes and slow to a crawl. But all your weapons and shields also draw from the same power source, and if your batteries run low or you just feel up to a higher challenge, you can boost through the level to recharge, racing past obstacles at a much riskier breakneck speed. But the most interesting runner-up was easily Switch and Shoot, a game that forces you to play a shmup with one button. Every time you hit it, you fire once, but you also reverse direction, and these dual purposes can get you in trouble in a lot of different ways, where you can hyper-focus on shooting one enemy only to realize that you've sent yourself ricocheting into another. It harkens back a bit to games like Quop, where just figuring out how to even play the game without dying in five seconds feels like an accomplishment. And much like Hyper Gauntlet, it's one of those games you can see most of in ten minutes, but still want to chase a high score for the fun of it hours later. But there are, of course, plenty of other action games in this bundle that don't fall under such a neat umbrella. Somos is another mind-breaking game with a stunning aesthetic that looks deceptively simple at first, but gets challenging quickly. Somos divides the screen up into two fields, and then gives you a series of enemies that you have to click on to pop. But whenever you click on an enemy, you fly to the opposite half of the screen, and enemies are always gravitating towards both places, so you're constantly juggling both sides, trying to make sure they're both safe while your efforts inevitably veer you closer to danger somewhere else where you're not paying attention. It's all wrapped up in a sharp, abstract presentation that makes its closest analog feel like Toph. 
In an incredibly similar vein is Soft Body, a brain-melting twin-stick game that requires you to separately control two different worm things at once. I think the moment where I realized what I was in for was this level, where I had to control the little worm thing on my left with my right hand, and the worm thing on the right with my left. You can also check out Central Limit Theorem, which is kind of like Missile Command, except it has the additional twist that the enemies hurtling towards you can learn and adapt. Anytime a missile flies over the colored path of another missile, it adopts that second missile's properties in addition to its own. So this yellow thing flying around can learn how to start shooting projectiles at you once it hits a patch of blue. It's basically just a game jam experiment, so it has a ton of untapped potential to be expanded upon, but it still makes for a fun little 15 minutes. But while all of these games made for interesting Twitch-based experiences, the one I want to talk about is a classic that earns its spot just for being impeccably crafted. Bleed 2. Bleed is an absolute riot, and its sequel, Bleed 2, is even better. It's a side-scrolling arcade shooter that's filled to the brim with wild action set pieces, sick guitar riffs, and bosses, bosses, bosses. This game made it dang close to being in my Boss Rush video, and in hindsight, it really should have gone in there, because in Bleed 2, they literally show up every two minutes. There's not a whole ton to actually say about Bleed, because what you see is very much what you get. It's an incredibly straightforward action romp that's notable largely because it's executed in near perfection. The controls are smooth and responsive, the ridiculous action sequences you end up in make for incredible boss fights, and the music is awesome. The artist, Yukio Kalio, also did the music for Nuclear Throne and Minute, two of the bigger ticket items in this bundle, by the way. Each game is also basically just an hour long, so you can blast through it all in one sitting, though they do have some replayability. Bleed does have a few interesting ideas of its own, though. Most notably that the main character, Rin, comes equipped with a katana she can use to parry objects back to their sender, a mechanic that plays into a lot of different boss fights. Its story is also surprisingly off the wall for a fluff excuse to throw you through a bunch of cool action scenes, with Rin starting out deciding that she wants to be the world's ultimate hero and setting out to beat up every other hero to prove she can be, then culminating in the second game in a popularity battle with an actual arch nemesis that comes with a brilliant twist gimmick on how that narrative beat affects the fight. But more than being a wildly innovative game, Bleed 2 is just a well-executed cult classic in a genre that doesn't get enough attention. And bonus points, if you ever have a buddy over again once this whole corona thing ends, it's got couch co-op. But if all these shooters and action games are a bit too fast-paced to be your speed, then let's take a minute to talk about a few strategy games. It's not the most well-represented category in this bundle, but there are a fair few titles that are worth checking out. Dorf Romantic isn't a half-bad place to start. The best way I could describe it is as a single-player Carcassonne. You start with an empty board and a deck full of tiles, and you go about making an idyllic countryside dotted with little hamlets. The twist, though, is that your deck is limited, but when you accomplish certain goals, like connecting enough forest tiles together, the game gives you more. It's not hard to get on a roll, though, and once you do, you could technically keep going on forever. So, the map can get pretty big. Dorf Romantic is still in production, and in its current state, it feels more like a vertical slice than a whole game, but it falls into the same vein as a recent Townscaper and may well tickle your fancy. There's also The Captain's Log, a 15-minute little adventure where you're the captain of a spaceship that got launched light years from home and now needs to make its way back. Calling it a strategy game might be a bit of a stretch, as the only gameplay involves balancing supply meters by going to different colored stars, but the aesthetic of this one is what's really worth sticking around for. And then finally, there's Hive Time. Hive Time's a nifty little base builder, except get this, you get to make a beehive. Expand honeycomb by honeycomb, spawn new bees to support your growing economy, and juggle an ever-growing network of resources. Oh, and then you get this ominous message that you need to get enough jelly to make a new queen before your current one dies. No pressure. Hive Time's main joy is how it satisfyingly sets up a pipeline of resources to balance, primary among them being your population of worker bees. You'll start specializing your population pretty quickly, but bees have short lifespans and constantly have to be replaced, so you're always monitoring and tweaking your nursery's output to make sure you have enough bodies for each job, including nursery bees to make sure you keep producing a steady population in the first place. You'd better do it quickly, too, because you have to jack your entire economy up exponentially in order to get a new queen. And then, of course, the fun comes in when you try to do that a little too quickly, it turns out you don't have enough honey production and your whole economy stalls for five minutes until you fix the problem. It's not the deepest base builder I've ever played. If you want that, the best you'll find in this bundle is the Dwarf Fortress-like, and definitely not under five hours long game, Odd Realm, but what it does, it still does really well, and it wraps it all up in a cutesy aesthetic you won't find too often in this genre. 
But speaking of deep, rich games, if you're a puzzle fan, you've also got more than a few options to pick from in this bundle. And of the ones I've played, there are a few highlights. You could start with The Line, perhaps the first games-as-service puzzle game I've ever seen. The basic setup is that you have to connect each symbol to its partner, but the catch is that you have to use everything on the board to do it. And you can't cross the streams, either. So you'll have to drag all these different lines into twister-like knots in order to solve a puzzle, often with different lines looping around back into themselves multiple times to get the job done. But the truly bizarre and fascinating part of Line is the metagame surrounding those puzzles. They're all micro-puzzles that can be solved in a minute each, often less, but there are straight up hundreds of them. And on top of that, the game randomly generates 25 new ones every day that you can grind out for currency to unlock skins and stuff. I can't say I'm entirely on board with that model, but it does make Line a pretty singular experiment, and if you ever find yourself waking up in the morning itching for a puzzle, it's the same as getting up every day for 20 minutes to do a New York Times daily crossword or something. Or check out Ungrounded, a 10-minute little game that has you growing a forest to reach the sun. Ungrounded's aesthetic is absolutely killer, and it's almost all mathematically calculated. Every time you plant a seed, it grows a tree, but as you take seeds from new trees, they start mutating into different forms. So at the start, every tree will look like this, but they'll quickly start changing to look more like this. Then you can become an amateur geneticist by only selecting seeds from the tallest trees to raise the sun, or mess around and see what cool trees you can produce. Similarly banking on an interesting aesthetic, there's also Reki, which has an abstract architecture vibe very similar to last year's Etherborn that puzzle games like to gravitate towards. It's sharp and clean, and most of the gameplay revolves around these colored blocks. Depending on the color, they move in one direction or another, and you need to move them into place so you can get to the finish. Reki is, honestly, a pretty straightforward puzzle game, but it's still perhaps the most eyebrow-raising title I saw on this entire list. Not because it's some sublime work of genius, but because this game literally came out a week before the bundle went live, and they're arguably not making any money off of this. You can maybe argue that there's some cynical free press to be had here to make it all worthwhile, especially because this game got overlooked on its initial launch, but spending years of your life developing a commercial product only to immediately throw your game away to hundreds of thousands of people basically for free is a massive sacrifice. Like, that is not a small decision. And I feel like the developers at Beyond Those Hills deserve at least a little bit of a spotlight for putting themselves out there like that. But that note aside, the puzzle game that I really want to talk about is Puzz Logic. Puzz Logic is inspired by Sudoku. Loosely. It takes the basic premise of numbers not being able to double up in any given row, column, or cell, and promptly makes it the least important rule by adding all kinds of other rules you have to follow on top of it. Certain columns have to add up to a specific number, eventually multiple colors of blocks start getting introduced, and then you get rows that need both colors to add up to different specific numbers, and so on. The result is something that is distinctly different than Sudoku, but still scratches the exact same itch. It also falls into a similar vein as Picross-like Murder by Numbers earlier this year, so if you enjoyed that, I highly recommend checking it out. Once you get halfway down its list of puzzles, Puzzle Logic starts becoming very much like Sudoku, and how this simple crossword-looking thing becomes an interwoven puzzle box that takes 30 minutes to unravel. Or at least that's how long it took me. Look, don't judge me for being bad at puzzle games. That puzzle box vibe makes Puzzle Logic feel tighter and more enjoyable to pick apart than any other puzzle game on this list, indeed almost any puzzle game I've played in the past year. Perhaps most ingenious of all is the way that the game can give you an almost entirely blank Sudoku puzzle like this, and you can solve it almost entirely through the layers of restrictions it places on you. It doesn't quite qualify as a game under 5 hours, but it's probably one of the most fun games I've played so far in this entire bundle, and so I can't recommend it enough. But maybe you want a game to make you think in a different way, and in that case, you've still got a ton of options when it comes to brief, thoughtful, narrative-focused games. I'm talking about stuff like your Knights in the Woods or your Dujanas. For example, you could check out Island's Non-Places, a little game that has you interacting with some surreal scenery that never reacts quite how you expect it to. It's full of visual non-sequiturs and surreal imagery, and it's all largely just for the sake of basking in its own surrealness. That or someone just got away with marketing their very nice 3D modeling portfolio. But either way, it's a fun and simple 20-minute dive into the uncanny. You could also check out A Mortician's Tale, which as its name would imply, is about a character working in a funeral house. Specifically, your job is to prepare bodies for the wake. The story and gameplay are pretty simple, but Mortician's Tale works best as an educational device. It shines a light on an almost entirely unexplored profession, and always takes the time to go above and beyond in delivering details about how and why the industry works the way it does, and those details were fascinating to dig into. 
But if you want something entirely narrative focused, you can go play Far From Noise, which follows the worst night of a 20-something person's life as their car dangles helplessly over a cliff. They spend the entire night staring death in the face, and that understandably leads to a lot of philosophical meditating… and an extended conversation with a deer? But it's meant to be a slow, quiet, and thoughtful game, much like the final title that I want to highlight in this wrap-up. Let's finally talk about The Stillness of the Wind. Remember Stardew Valley? That game that was all like, hey, screw your boring office job, come out here and be a farmer! Come be one with nature and make life grow by the sweat of your not brow. Well, the part Stardew Valley likes to gloss over is that the whole farming part of that proposition would actually be incredibly tedious, time-consuming, and dry work, just like your office job is. And the only reason Stardew Valley is fun is because plowing your plot of land takes 30 seconds, not 30 hours. And it's that counterpoint that Stillness of the Wind nails. This game sets you up as a lone granny farming out in the desert. You milk goats to make cheese, garden tomatoes, and the highlight of your day is when the traveling merchant pops by, the only real human interaction you ever get, who often brings by letters from your family. But you do it all at the pace of a snail. A trip to the well for water takes almost a full minute. You only have enough time to complete two or three tasks before the day ends, so I hope you make the most of it. And on top of it all, the days keep getting shorter for some reason, and increasingly grim portents are showing up in those letters you're getting. Stillness of the Wind is meant to be this slow-paced, thought-provoking piece, a quiet and subdued time for reflection alone in the middle of the desert. But for me, it was just incredibly stressful. You move so painstakingly slowly, and there's so little time to get your work done. I woke up at dawn, never finished working until well after the sun went down, made myself a bowl of melted cheese because that's all there was to eat, went to sleep, and then did the same thing again. And that just feels like a fucking miserable way to live, and it reminded me far too much of how I live myself, especially under COVID quarantine. Every day in this game, I frustratedly tried to nudge this poor old lady along faster because the sun was going down and I still hadn't even started the gardening work yet, but I needed those tomatoes to eat, damn it. And that struck a very personal chord with me and made me reflect on frustrations with my own work schedule, where it feels like I'm always desperately looking at the clock and how I have to be somewhere in two hours, and yet also feel like I get more unproductive every week during that time I do have. And as the days grew shorter and my time dwindled in-game, I started cutting out non-essential activities. If I just let the flowers which don't serve any gameplay purpose on the farm die, I could save myself a trip to the well and get almost a third of the day back. And all it took was the denial of one of the exceptionally few pleasures that this old lady got to enjoy in her life. And if that doesn't remind me of all the times I've crunched on a video in the past to the exclusion of all else, I don't know what does. At the very least, though, when I'm done with all of my work, I get to enjoy far better rewards and creature comforts than just a bowl of melty-ass cheese. Stillness of the Wind is a grim look at what would be an abjectly miserable life, bereft of almost any pleasure or comfort that somehow only ever gets worse as the game goes on. And while I don't think I came away with any of the lessons it was intended to impart, I still found it to be a thoroughly thoughtful and worthwhile game in the vein of something like a bite-sized pathologic. And I definitely think it's worth a look. Whew. Okay. I think that's everything. Okay, well, it's definitely not everything. This is a bundle of like 1700 games, but I'm one guy, and as we just got done talking about, there's only so much time in the day, and there's just frankly more games here than any one person can consume. So, if you guys do want to see more of this bundle outside of my recommendations, here are a few other sources you can check that will all be down in the description. First, there's a website called randombundlegame.com, which is a database of the entire bundle that will give you random recommendations, or let you start narrowing your search down by genre, or, get this, even length. It's literally a stumble upon created for the express purpose of exploring this monster bundle and finding a few random gems that even I've never heard of. You can also check out one person named Toma's Quest to review every single game in the bundle, currently at 215 reviews at the time of writing. I'd also recommend giving Errant Signal a look as he's covered a fair few games on this list in the past and is just a general good place to get more recommendations like this, as well as Ragnarok's, whose most recent roundup of indie horror titles almost all ended up in this bundle just a few weeks later. And finally, here's an absolute last rapid-fire list of games that I thought looked really interesting and absolutely wanted to play, but just did not have the time to get to because this video would have taken another month to come out. A Normal Lost Phone, Beacon, Dungeons and Lesbians, Gun Rounds, Task Force Compass, Heavy Bullets, Breakout, Cardinal Chains, Risk System, 
Dr. Langaskov, the Tiger, and the Terribly Cursed Emerald. A New Life, The World Begins With You, Odd Realm, Parallax, and Please. I wish that I could have gotten to these, and I wish that there was infinite time to do it with, but, well, there isn't, and there are other projects to get to, so it's unfortunately time to say thank you for watching all the way through. Covering short and novel experiences like these is my bread and butter. When I'm not buried under an ungodly massive bundle, I'm putting out reviews for games like these every week, so if you liked any of these recommendations, please hit that subscribe button, or even better, go hit up my Patreon. But until then, I'll see you all next week.